my focus together with my team is on the software side with the vision of having in the near future something where we can develop applications for this industrial IoT as simple, so you mentioned usability already, as you can develop apps for the smartphone today. And this of course needs mighty abstractions. We already heard in your wonderful keynote how you can do that on a data-based um, abstraction, so how simple it looked, the program, and so I'm exactly also working in that direction. And to show you a little bit the path of the research, I put down some of the projects here. And so autonomy is something very important here because if we want to have high usability, we have to automate whatever is possible in order to reach the goals of the systems that we want to have. And their security is definitely one very important thing in self-configuration. So coming from this autonomy, the next thing was looking at building automation systems because they are complex network systems where you can do something in order to orchestrate all the things in these buildings and then also moving to the industrial control systems here and more recently also into energy systems and I especially show this because the first two projects were projects with Siemens so unluckily they are over at the moment and so together with Arne we are currently also working on new project proposals of course and so there's more to come. Okay, that's that. So when you look at software for controlling complex systems like industrial IoT systems, then you can use this nice analogy. You might know this lamp, it's from the Swedish um, producer of furniture here. And so I chose this one here because it's very well showing what we are doing. Then we're taking a monolithic software piece and we're tearing this thing here. So it's the S star lamp here. And so now it's going into the different pieces. And this is exactly what we can do with complex software. So we can decompose the complex software into building blocks, and then we can recombine these building blocks. This is exactly this composition we are talking about in order to achieve different purposes. And this is highly beneficial because these building blocks that we have here, they are small, they're compact, you can validate them, you can ensure that they have some security properties, and then by combining, composing these building blocks in a suitable way, you can have better systems in the end. And so this is definitely one of the aims of the research we are looking at there. And so here we see already different components, and I want to start with this example, which is exactly from this industrial control project here. So what we have here is we have a production plant where we have different robots that are moving around. So we have some robots that are walking here on this path. So they are shipping some equipment from this station here to the other station. And at the same time, we have some freely moving robots in there. And what we did now is that we took the control out of the robots and put it into software components that we're running in the back end. So in this case, it was running in the edge there. And the good thing we already heard about sensor fusion in the keynote before, the good thing is that this allows us to have cheaper robots because not all robots have to have, for instance, this quite expensive LiDAR tool here. And what you see here is that we have different software components and when we want to softwareize such a system, of course, we have to create the connectivity between the physical world and the machinery here and the software world. And this is what we do by such gateways here. So we have gateways interfacing this and they are exposing the interfaces as we've seen this morning. So you have then data points that you can interact with where you can, for instance, say, okay, the angle of the robot should be like this. And then these pieces here are reflecting it to the real world so that you have the virtual representation in the software world always in accordance to the physical representation here ideally. And then what we want to do is localization. So we want to make sure that these robots do not crash into each other. And we have the control of if the robots can move also in software and we have our collision avoidance algorithm. And so on the left here, we see a demo scenario. So it's a fisheye. This is why it's such an interesting perspective. So we see one robot here and this one is the one that is going on this path and it only has an ultrasonic distance sensor that is just going to the front. And what we were doing there is we were enriching the scenario by using the sensor fusion. So we are using the LiDAR of the other robots to create a map of the entire system there. And then we tell in the software to these robots here 
that they should stop once the other robot is getting closer to them, even though they cannot see. Because as you will see now here, the robot will be moving, the other one will be approaching, and as this one can only look to the front, it would normally stop very late if it even would stop. And we will see that it will stop early, the other one will pass, and only when it is in a safe distance, then the other one will continue driving. So let's see. So this one is moving now closer, and now it's getting the signal, okay, something is in your path, it's stopping, and now you see that there's a good safety margin here, so it's really waiting until this is far away, so it can never see this with the ultrasonic distance sensor that we have here, and when it's far away enough, then it continues driving. And so this is a very nice example how we can reduce the complexity of the devices while still having the system act in the way we wanted it to act. Okay, let's move back to this lamp here. So here are different properties that I will briefly talk about now. And most important, as said at the beginning, is when you design something that supports developers in creating such complex composed systems, autonomy, autonomous behavior is very helpful because that means you as platform provider can offer functionality, so-called by design, that others can use then and they cannot destroy these properties. Usability is also very important because as it's complex, you have to provide interfaces that enable simple orchestration, simple composition of these entities. So what we did in the research is we looked at, okay, what are basic properties that all these entities need to become composable? And obviously it's connectivity, you need discovery. So this is interesting because then you can implement late binding between components, meaning that when you bring in new devices in your car, for instance, that you can have some plug and play, so not like the computer did before, some plug and play in the sense that the component is integrated because it's only late discovered, meaning that services only couple when they really need the connectivity. <coughs> And so as an example from a building is then that when you want to switch on all lights inside your plant and you bring in new lights as the service is only binding when it wants to switch the lights on, it will automatically discover also new lights and if some lights are not there anymore, it will also not be a problem. So this makes the system much more dynamic if you have this capability. And the last thing is data management because we're computer scientists and data management is you have data coming in, then you have some algorithms doing some processing, and then you have data coming out that does some control. And therefore, if you can provide the data management as something that is part of your platform, so the developers of the applications do not have to take care of it, then this is beneficial, as we will see on the next slides. Okay, so what we did is we combined all this and said it's a building block that you can use when you want to develop software for such a composable IoT scenario. And the key point here is you need the discovery, and for the discovery you need semantics. So we've heard about semantics in the morning already, and so what you need is you need something that you can use for the discovery. And therefore you can use tags, so there are different solutions offering it. Your solution is probably the best one because it's getting standardized right now. And uh, so here this is just the concept, so you have tags and with these tags you can do this late discovery, you can look for the lights and then you can access the data of the lights and say okay the light should be on or the light should be off. And this is quite powerful to use as we've also seen before. So when you think about now this decomposing the IoT services into building blocks, what you typically have is that you had a service before, so this was a closed LAN, and now you're decomposing it into building blocks so it looks like this. And so what you typically do is that you somehow connect these services directly so you have some basic functionality here and they couple. So this is what you have with normal web service, service or entity architecture for instance. And as we pulled out now this basic functionality here, the picture is a little different so we eliminate the connection between the services up here and instead have the connection here into the parts of the software that are controlled by us. And so this is a key result from what we did because if you have this, this enables you to control who can talk to whom. 
And this is the basis for introducing important features like security by design. Because if you are the broker between all these services and not the service developers that do the logic here, then you can introduce several nice features in here. Okay, so one of the features you can introduce is resilience. So Anna was talking about it already. And regarding resilience, you have two things that we do there. So we look at these services as they are highly decoupled and encapsulated, what you can do is you can simply replicate the services. So you can have several instances of a service and you can do normal failover of that. At the same time, you can also replicate data. And this is very powerful because it helps you if you think that this is running on different IoT entities, it helps you to make sure that even when a service is going down or a device is going down, your data is still available. And this is something also very important for the IoT because there often you need historic data of something. So you need to know, for instance, how a temperature was in the past and so on. And if you have these automated replication mechanisms here, you can still have the data available even though your data sources here are not available anymore. So it's a very powerful and nice mechanism to have that. Okay, coming to the next point, security. So this is always my key aspect because <coughs> especially as we have these cyber physical systems, so systems that now can really with the software touch us and hurt us. So when we think about the large robot arms that are used for producing cars, for instance, you can easily be run over by these systems. And so therefore having security and also having safety are key elements. And the security is something that we cannot build into the systems to a later point in time. So we have to have it in from the beginning. And therefore, if you're designing something there, take the security seriously. Okay, so security. I briefly told about, talked about it already. So what we can do, if we have control over who's talking to whom, we can implement access control. And so this is very important for implementing the safety then afterwards as well, so that we can ensure that the components, so these software parts here only have the information they need. And why is it important? Because these software systems, they are also updated either over the air or, or over cable. So you have new software versions, for instance. And so they could change the behaviors. They could do things that you do not want to do. And so if you are able to specify what the system should be able to do and you can restrict it to not doing something else, then this is very helpful because then you can ensure that this is it's a secure and resilient system there. Another interesting thing we are doing is AI-based firewalling here. So sometimes you have components of third party that you don't have control over. And still you want to make sure that this system is not war driving, doing something you do not want. And therefore what we do there is we take a black box approach. So we take the component and we use artificial intelligence for analyzing the communication flows here and for modeling what the component is probably doing. And the better your model is, the better you can protect that the device is doing what it should do because then you can do anomaly detection because you have a model of how the system should behave and if it behaves differently and you have restrictive rule sets then you can prevent that from happening and this is again very powerful for having reliable systems okay good safety so this one here i wanted to to show you the aspect that when you have these physical systems and then you have the software representations of these systems, you obviously have a link between this gateway service to the physical component and the um, software world here. And what you want to do there is you want to make sure that the physical device is actually doing what it should do. So that it's aligned with the software world that we have on the other side. And therefore, what you can do there is you can do again the formal modeling of the device to check what it's doing and you can also do watermarking here and what is the aim so the aim is that when you have a component that is for instance controlling the robot arm you want to know for instance when it's not working properly anymore and so this could be an attack which would be one thing but it could also be normal wearing of the components and by using the modeling here so that you monitor different sensors and then you correlate this according to your model or by introducing watermarking, I will say something to it in a second, you can ensure that you notice when a component is starting to fail. 
And so with the water markings, and this is something we are currently working on, what you can do there is that when you have such a cyber-physical system, that you introduce behavior that is not functional for what the system should do. So when you have a pump, for instance, then it should pump at a certain point in time, but you introduce characteristic patterns in the movement of the pump. And if someone is attacking the system, or the parts of the system are getting older and getting wear out, then these characteristic additional signals that you put into what you can measure there, they will change drastically. And this enables you to find out even attacks that or, or bearings that are not so easy to detect. So this is a quite promising approach we're currently looking at. And this brings me already to the last part, also something we are working at at the moment. So when you do everything with software, latency is totally critical, of course, because you always have these paths here between the different components. And therefore, what we look at is cross-layer optimization. So how can you offer to the software developers an interface where they can specify which quality of service of the links they need? And how can you then put that into the substrate below your software, into the network components? How can you prioritize streams using software-defined networking and other technologies so that you can ensure that your time critical control flows are timely arriving at the destination while the others are still having the service quality that they want to have there. And so this is something that's still ongoing. This is why we also have less publications in this part. Another thing that reduces the latency here is also when you have the data, you can do caching, you can do predictive caching, placing information closer to the consumers. And this also makes it much faster, but brings challenges because you have to take care of consistency, for instance. Okay, so now we've seen a little bit of these different aspects and they all together help managing this complexity. And then in the end, we have hopefully an application again that is providing the same functionality, but much, much better. All right, so this to the technical part and now we wanted to close with highlighting again the collaboration and collaboration is always about people and so the ones with the green arrow so these are siemens people <laughs> additional to r and i had the pleasure to work with in the past so probably you know some of them here so norbert and christoph for instance maybe and uh, yeah so we had these uh, building as a service project in the past which was very successful so this was about the building automation and about model, gener model based generation of services so this is, it was a preliminary activity to what we are currently doing. Then we have the joint students here. So we have Jan as PhD students and continuously bachelor and master thesis that we're doing together. And the last point, also very important, we didn't mention it so much today, education. So education of the people who are working in the companies and also of the people at university, of course, and as I'm at university, so teaching is something very important there, of course. And there I want to draw the highlights to something you might be aware of already. So there's a collaboration, a French-German academy. This is with uh, two leading universities, with IMT in France and TUM in Germany. And so there I'm also leading the teaching activities. And in these teaching activities, we are also focusing on this professional training through, for instance, master of online courses. And so this is also something where I would be very happy to have more collaboration with uh, Siemens in the future. And it's, it's quite interesting because it's about doing efficient training of workforce while at the same time maintaining a very high quality. And something very concrete we are currently doing together is that Arne and I are organizing a summer school about IoT means AI, so all the important buzzwords are in the title already. <laughs> and so yeah, there will, their students will be working on IoT and AI challenges and we will use the Siemens devices for that. And um, yeah, so if you have uh, interested people, we are happy if you spread the word that this will happen. And here it still says Winter School 18 because we are planning that for quite a long time and in the end we decided that Munich is even nicer in summer and therefore we went through summer. And this concludes our talk. Thank you very much for the attention. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions regarding this? Okay. Yeah. I have a concrete question to you when you when you optimize the energy consumption over the system. 
Yeah. Is there the optimization? Is that actually some kind of bottleneck? How long does this take? Is that... <laughs> it, it is a bottleneck indeed, yeah. So uh, right now, like the approach that we have developed so far takes quite a long time to calculate that uh, that optimized uh, configuration. Although it's so few instances, like yeah, well, the, 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 so the, yeah, that the was in seconds, yeah. But if you scale but it up, so scale it up goes up. exponentially. So with this uh, project that we are planning to do with the CERN, then we have to think about other solutions. Yeah. Since you're doing it with CERN, they are also very interested in quantum computing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would be a uh, very interesting use case. Okay, super, yeah. <laughs> so talk with Thomas Sander. Okay, cool, thanks. Yes. Any more questions? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just waiting. <laughs> Um, then maybe I have one um, <coughs> regarding, you already mentioned it, uh, regarding this um, idea of uh, professional training together with Siemens maybe, but uh, yeah, maybe on both of you, are there any ideas or comments how to intensify the uh, cooperation between TUM and Siemens, other things that you um, yeah, came to your mind? Well, I mean, so an event like this one is always a great opportunity because you get to know what is happening, for instance, in your institution you were not aware of. And uh, so I think having joint projects is always a very good thing and also having um, some joint teaching activities with a clear goal is also something that is very attractive for both sides. So I think as long as you know exactly what you're doing it for, it's also something that is attractive for Siemens and this lifelong learning is something that will become more and more important in the future, I guess. Okay, thank you. So I think for me, yeah. the basis for collaboration is often the, the students that we work with. Yeah? So students that come from Tom work with us at Siemens in mutual supervision. So Anything that uh, supports this uh, collaboration uh, with students, I think, is, is uh, helping uh, collaboration between them and, and uh, okay. One question. Um, we saw before the iPraktikum from, from Stefan Brügge. Is there some format also at your institute and maybe also in yours? So because this was really... Um, yeah, we, we have really got good results after the yeah. six months practical work so, of students on, on each, each one. So, what, so, what, so the I practicum for those of you who don't know is, so this is that people from industry are coming with problems and then these problems are solved in teams. So I hope I, I was explaining it in a correct way. And so um, we have something where, so we are more, so Professor Burg is software techniques, so software development, and so we are network related and so um, I'm running a lab course there where we also have student projects where they develop something and there they especially develop teaching material for other students. Mm -hmm. And so there we always have a guiding topic where we do something and so last time it was IoT for instance. And so this will be very interesting also to have some input from Siemens like we have here some challenges the students could be working on, we have some technology that would be interesting and the outcome is not only that you have the students having a very nice experience, but also that afterwards you have some initial training material that you could even use inside Siemens maybe for training people and getting started with new technologies and so on. 